Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we're going to talk about the original Lizzie Hale Signature Explorer. This one didn't really get a fancy name like her second one being called the Dark Explorer, so let's just call it the Bright Explorer. Besides the Les Paul, from Gibson, the Explorer is my next favorite shape. There's just something about the way these things feel when you play them that I love. But the problem is, is I like fancy looking guitars and there's not a lot of Explorers that are all blinged out like these. And that's why I absolutely adore the artist signature Explorers that came out in the 2010s. We're talking things like the Brendan Small Thunder Horse, the Bill Kelleher Golden Axe, the Jason Hook M4 Sherman. Even in 2019, Lizzie got the Dark Explorer and these ones were done around 2014, the Bright Explorer. I thought this video was gonna be the last one of me documenting all the signature explorers. And it turns out I forgot one. Sammy Hagar also got one called the Red Rocker. So what makes this Explorer special is obviously it's giant bright alpine white finish, not only on the body, but also on the headstock. You've got some custom appointment features here like the tuners, as well as the pickup rings and a few other things that we'll discuss later. But since I've already talked about Lizzie in the Dark Explorer review, I thought we would go ahead and compare this one to the brand new Epiphone model, which basically just reissued these guitars. What is the difference between the old Gibson version and the new Epiphones? Starting with the headstock, the biggest thing that you'll notice is obviously one says Gibson right here and the other one says Epiphone, but look at how it's laid out. I personally really like the look of the Gibson just being at the top of the tuners instead of the Epiphone version, as you can see that just kind of like runs along the side. It makes the headstock look a bit goofy, in my opinion. Another small difference is the truss rod cover screws. The Epiphone will have the three style, whereas this one has more of the bell shape, traditional Gibson one. The nuts are made of different materials. The Gibson is a Tectoid nut and the Epiphone is a Graftec. Graftec is now what Gibson uses in, in current day production. But here's a bigger difference here. The fretboard on the original Gibson version is made of rosewood. Now the new Epiphone one did get an ebony fretboard. I'm guessing Lizzie actually wanted ebony on this, but these things were birthed right around that whole issue time for ebony when Gibson couldn't really source that much. So what they basically did was just source the darkest rosewood that they could find. I mean, this looks pretty dark. Another feature you'll notice is the Gibson ones, as usual, have the fret nibs, whereas the Epiphones have the fret over the edge. But take a look at the pick guard versus the Epiphone one. You see how this one has an even amount of space pretty much on all sides? The Epiphone one actually extends a little bit too far. And in my opinion, that's like a glaring flaw to me. Cosmetically anyways, you know, I prefer this style because it's more traditional. You'll notice that the bridges are different. This is Nashville in style, whereas the other one has a metric styled ABR1. The pickups are also different. Your whole electronics will be different. These are USA made Gibson 57 Classic in the neck and a 57 Plus in the bridge. Whereas you get the Alnico Classic Pros in the Epiphone. The Gibson's just got a regular brown Gibson case with kind of a reddish pink interior. Whereas the Epiphones, they actually got the Hailstorm logo on that. So that's kind of cool. But ultimately it kind of came down to cost. These were USA made, so you likely have higher quality woods on these, and they were $2,299 new. They didn't come with a certificate of authenticity, but they were finished in nitro versus the made in China Epiphones at $849 new that have a COA, but they have a poly finish. Now, what does that mean for you? Poly finishes are thicker. However, unfortunately, during this time of Gibson history, their white finishes were not so good. They will prematurely maturely turn yellow and you can see that's very evident on the headstock of this one. It's not necessarily just how you store it. In fact, storing them in the case is actually sometimes bad for these things because I've heard it's the off gassing of the lacquer or something like that that actually causes that to happen. So things like the bucket head model, I've seen ones that people say are mint condition, always been in the case, but they're all yellowed out. This example, it, it's not too bad, but it has this weird finish streaking in it where it's almost like the case leached into the finish or something. 
So sometimes having the poly finish isn't so bad if you want to keep it white. It won't age as easily. So that's some of the differences. I'm sure the Epiphone versions are very good and they get you the same look and vibe of this really cool Explorer for a third of the price. But you know, if you can pick up a used Gibson one at a fair price, I think they're both good options because Epiphone really can make great stuff, especially their higher end signature guitars. I recently reviewed the Jared James Nichols guitar. That one felt good, but that Snow Falcon will always have a lasting impression on me. So to learn a little bit more about this one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts. Inside the Lizzie Hale Bright Explorer. I think what makes this one interesting, besides being an Explorer Custom at half the price and not being made in the custom shop, is the specs of the parts that she did on these. So you've got locking Grover tuners here that have the special pearl tips. Personally, I hate these things. They're really hard to turn. You can't use your speed winders on them because they're just a little bit too small. But, you know, at least they're locking tuners, right? You don't have to go around 100 million times. But the tailpiece and bridge are also locking variants. I want to explain this first because it's kind of what makes this guitar interesting. So locking bridge, locking tailpiece. It's not something you see every day, but they're out there. Basically, you use a little Allen key right there that's included in the case. And once you have the bridge where you want it to be, you tighten that down and then it kind of hugs that post. Now, the only benefit I can see is if you take your strings off, your bridge will no longer fall off. But I'm sure there has something to do with intonation, how the bridge won't move ever so slightly. And the tailpiece has the exact same thing going on. You can see the screws right there. Now, unfortunately, one of those little locking screws was missing from the bridge. And I figured, well, the bridge is probably the more important of the two. So I took it from the tailpiece and did it there. But here you can see what the back of the bridge looks like. And then it's Tone Pro's brand. I don't believe Lizzie did this on the Dark Explorer. So that is a difference. Pickup wise though, like I was saying, you got the 57 in the neck and a 57 plus in the bridge. So within the circuit, the bridge pickup reads 8.16. In the neck, that's still pretty hot, almost eight. And in the middle, just for fun, about four. But there you can see your neck tenant says AW for Alpine White. And then DXLZY. Deluxe Lizzie? I'm not sure. Or it could just mean Explore Lizzie, but then I don't know what the D stands for. It's also important to note somebody took the cover off of this pickup at one point in time. You can see that right there, but they put it back on. But the thing with the golden pickup rings is it's only a little plate and it's held on by the height adjustment screw. So you could take those off if you'd rather just have a white pickup ring. And you have to leave the pick guard on this model because it has the routing underneath it. But this is not metal like the pickup ring toppers. This is just kind of a golden plastic. Which can you imagine if that was metal? Oh man, so many fingerprints. I hate these things just because of that. But they wipe off just fine. Now for full disclosure, this screw hole is a bit stripped and these bottom two screw holes are stripped. Now they'll go in when you want to take them out, you have to apply some upward pressure in order for them to come out. Stock from the factory, this would actually have golden speed knobs. This is the only remaining replaced part on here. So you got two volumes for your neck and bridge, and then a master tone. And you do have binding along this mahogany body. That's a spec that most explorers do not have. And your output jack is on the side. Moving on to the fretboard, you've got the acrylic inlays, as you can see right there. But I love this rosewood fretboard. It's super dark, but still a little bit rosy looking. It's like perfect for this. The frets only show very minor wear, nothing that I would really worry about. But you can see somebody has put the graphite powder in the nut. The headstock does not have binding. A lot of people go, oh, it should be bound, which I don't really understand that because I think an Explorer headstock bound would look really weird because it would make it look small. But anyways, the truss rod cover has Lizzie Hale's signature embossed on it. And it's just pure white. And the truss rod's in perfect shape on this one. While we're pointing out differences between dark and light, the Dark Explorer got a rich light fretboard and it also got a Mother of Pearl Gibson logo instead of the silk screen on this one. I get a 1.68 inch nut width, which increases to 2.07 at the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.84. And by the 12th, 0.9, it is a rather thin feeling neck with a traditional 24 and 3 quarters inch scale. Moving on to the back here, not too much to go over the staining that we were kind of talking about. Then this was modified once before with different pickups. This is my work getting the original pickups back in. I, 
I don't think I caused the burns, but maybe I did. I don't remember. That was a couple of months ago. Pretty sure I learned my lesson the first time I did that. But you have the large brass strap buttons here. You've got one there, then one located back here. But just mahogany body and a mahogany neck here. Slim tapered neck profile is what I would call it. And you do have a serial number, 2014 model, and there's your serial. And we'll take a closer look at those locking tuners. Just in case you don't understand how locking tuner works, it's not that they make tuning a guitar easier necessarily. It, it makes... just makes it easier to restring them quickly because you just pull it taut and then you lock it down by moving these wheels. Well, great. See, I let the E string go there. <laughs> but that just clamps it. So that takes the place of all the windings around the post. So if you don't know how to properly wrap a post, these things make life a lot easier. It's just easier to do string changes. This example weighs 8 pounds, 8.6 ounces. Let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. My final thoughts on the Lizzie Hale Explorer. Honestly, I liked this one better than the Dark Explorer. Nothing against rich light boards. I just kind of had a bad buying experience with that guitar. I don't know if it's because I tuned it a step lower than normal, but it just kept inspiring me to play more and more. What I really liked out of this thing was actually the tones I was getting out of the original 57, 57 plus pickups. Something that I consider like a really good guitar tone is like the another brick in the wall solo. And despite this thing having humbuckers, it got me in that kind of a territory when I was doing some soloing stuff. So it's kind of a rather fat sounding guitar. I really enjoyed it. The finished blemishes, yeah, they kind of stink, but once you start playing it, you really don't care about that. So I would suggest checking one of these out if you see one. Now that we know all about the Lizzie Hale Explorer, let's go ahead and review its condition in case you're interested in purchasing it. Please do keep in mind, this was once a modified Explorer. I kind of changed it back to original. Someone had a different truss rod cover on it. I've got the original back on it now. It had double white pickups, so I put the original 57 Classics back in. The only thing that's not original on this guitar is the knobs right now. These originally shipped with gold and speed knobs. But to be honest, I think these match the vibe of this guitar so much better because you got all this gold that the reflectors just add to it. But condition wise, you can see the headstock has definitely yellowed. It's not like pea yellow or anything, but you can especially tell the difference when you're looking at the side of the instrument and then you get a glimpse of the front. 
Unfortunately, it's just common on this model. Now you can see some graphite staining on the nut. But I conditioned the rosewood fretboard. I think that was about a month or two. I definitely don't need to do it again. The frets are also looking good. Very minimal wear. I mean, this rosewood board is actually beautiful. I... Now it's kind of hard to see that staining in the finish. So I'll try to go by slowly enough so you can see it. It's kind of hard to really pinpoint where it's at, but it looks like it's showing up here. It's just kind of a mild imperfection to the finish. I don't see any like a uh, huge nicks or dings on the front of the guitar or anything. It's mainly just that staining phenomenon. Now you will see there's, you know, fingerprints and stuff on the pick guard. And that's just how these pickups are, especially with those little gold toppers. They will show fingerprints as soon as you touch this thing. But the gold is pretty worn on the tailpiece and the bridge. Back of the headstock, you know, not too much wear, maybe just a tiny little bit of edge wear, but you can see your serial number there. No brakes, cracks, or repairs to the neck, but I do want you to be aware of a very small finish check right here, and then there's like a small one right there. Not really sure what caused those. They're not a break into the wood or anything, but they're present, so I want you to know about it. You've got this kind of slim feeling neck. I thought it was pretty comfortable. You just have minor impressions on there. And then up here, you do have some finish checking by the uh, heel joint. Very common on white finish guitars, especially when the finish bunches up around here. Sometimes it can look like the neck has like been cracked off, but it's just because the finish was kind of thick. That's nothing to really worry about. And then you got a tiny little one forming there. What that means for you is eventually there'll just be a line but it's in pretty good shape right now. Now the back, uh, surprisingly, it's not really chewed up by buckle rash or anything, but again, you do have that staining phenomenon. A little bit more present on the back, I would say, than the front. So maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to leave this one out of the case, but I don't see any like huge gouges or anything. So just very light buckle worming. And we'll take a quick look around the edges. I mean, surprisingly, despite this thing actually being played quite a bit, I bought this one from a fan of the show about seven months ago. It took me that long just to restore it and be like, hey, I should do an Explorer today. But he buys all the signature Explorers and he said he gigged this thing, but man, he must take impeccable care of his gear. Let's go ahead and take a look under Blacklight. Looking under Blacklight here, now we can see where it's been played because you've got the uh, sweat absorption areas right there, kind of where your arm would rest. But what I really like seeing here is how the white pickup rings, I love the way they look with the body, but under blacklight, you can see those glow, but the metal toppers don't. So it just looks like your pickups are glowing. That's kind of cool. But I don't see anything too crazy up here. You can see some more sweat absorption in this area. But no stand rash or anything. Take a quick look around the neck heel so you can not worry about that. Then the neck has definitely absorbed some sweat. Maybe there is a little hair of stand rash right here, but or at least something reacted with the nitro finish. But yeah, I would say this definitely passes the black light test with glowing colors. This Explorer still retains its original Gibson USA case. I would say for the most part, it's in pretty good shape, but you do have a few scuffs and tears in the Tolex. Got a few here. I would say the biggest ones like this scratch mark right there, and especially right there. But the way I see it is as long as your handle's there and all three of your latches are present, you're good to go. So the interior, I would say it's a pink color. It's got good heel support. It's kind of got a huge neck rest, kind of as explorers do. And inside the compartment here, you have the two Allen keys for adjusting the locking bridge. You have the owner's manual and the inspected by checklist. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Lizzie Hale Bright Explorer, you can check out the link in the description that'll take you to the Reverb for Sale page. Honestly, whoever gets this one, I think you're really gonna like it. If I just needed a really nice sounding Explorer, I mean, that's how happy I was with the tones out of this thing. But thank you Troglodytes for tuning in today, and we will see you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.